Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. And to all those that are in our Zoom, a uh, blessed good morning to everybody, to all of you. And our love and prayer uh, goes to our uh, sister Carol and uh, brother uh, VR and to everybody who is uh, having a hard time at this moment in their life. The song that we sang a while ago says, count your blessings. And one of that blessing is actually the uh, gift of our Lord, which is salvation. So a wonderful blessing from God that he had given us the opportunity to be with him someday in heaven. Get my okay. Right. Now, a um, couple of weeks ago, we did discuss about John 3.16. And we all know that John 3.16 tells us of the great love of God towards us. Now, on the other hand, uh, it must raise a question to us of why Jesus, now being the only son, uh, came down and died for all of us. As you go through John 3.16, two things that you will learn. One is that God so loved you so much and that there's a reason why Jesus Christ came here on earth. Now, there must be a problem that God would, you know, would like to solve and accomplish through the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for Jesus to, to take off, to take off his deity, being God and die on the cross. So it must be something that's really important that they, that they want to accomplish. Okay? And there is indeed a great problem. That's why God gave his only begotten son. Now, the problem is the word sin. That is our problem. That's the, the big problem that we have. That's why Christ came and died for all of us. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's my problem. And that is your problem. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, in the plan of salvation by God, you know, God did their part. Right? God did their part. God the Father <clears throat> did his part by sending his son here on earth to die on the cross. Now, Jesus did his part. He did this part by dying on that cruel day on that cross. Now, those are their part. Now, the question is that we have to ask ourselves is what is our part? What is my part? Though salvation, as we all know, is freely given to everybody, there must be something that we need to do, right? Now, according to the Bible, there must be something that you must need to do in order for you to have that salvation, in order for you to have that free gift that God wants to give us, to give to all of us. Now, it is free in the essence that we don't have to pay any amount, right? It is free because you don't have to pay anything for that salvation because Christ already paid it in full. He paid it by shedding his blood, you know, his sweat and blood on that cross. Jesus paid it in full. Though there is a condition for 
for all of us to have that salvation. If you read John 3.16, in between those, in, the, in between that verse, you will see that there is something that you must do. That there is a condition in order for you to have that salvation. Now, the big question is, okay, let me ask again. I keep on asking you this question. Who wants to go to heaven? That's the big question. Okay, Who wants to go to heaven? All of us wants to go to heaven. Now, here's the bigger question. And you know what's the next question that I will ask? Who wants to go first? All right. <clears throat> now, all of you, all of us, wants to go to heaven. Right? I know that. But what is the biggest question? The biggest question is, what must I do to be saved? What must you do to be saved? Acts 237, the people ask, brothers, what shall we do? And in Acts 16:30, it was asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And this is the most important question that each and every one of us should be asking ourselves if we want to go to heaven. Now, without a doubt, this inquiry holds immense importance for any individual especially those who want to go to heaven. Now, <clears throat> over the years, I have heard some of the misconceptions that people have talking about salvation. Now, I would like to go through some of those and we will see from the perspective, from their perspective, how it is to be saved. Now, these are some of the, I would say, misconceptions about salvation that people have. And again, over the years, I have heard most of these reasons. And most reasons that I've heard is that people say, I will go to heaven because I am a good person. And that's good enough. I am a good person. You see, the, mis the first misconception of man is that I am a good person. I am not stealing, Brother Mike. I am not cursing. I'm not doing bad things like those people, the other people are doing. And I'm living an honest to goodness life. So I am good. I am going to heaven. I am a good husband. I'm a good father to my children. I am a good brother. I'm a good sister. Then I know God, you know, will welcome me to heaven. Then others would say, I'm doing charitable deeds. I'm giving to this and to that. I'm a good person. There's nothing wrong with me. I know that God will see in me the good things that I've done over the years and that he will welcome me in heaven. In Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us or prepared in advance for us to do. Now, this verse, it clearly says that salvation is by grace. No doubt. We can read it. Salvation is by grace. And through what? It says there, through faith. Now, look at the word. It is not from yourselves. This means that salvation does not come from any one of us. It is not dependent on us because it says there it is a free gift from God. It comes from God. Now, what does the word, uh, the words that means not by works in verse 9? What does it mean? Not by works. It means that we can never attain salvation by any kind of good works. Let me repeat that. We can never attain salvation by any kind of good works apart from Jesus Christ. Salvation is only and true Jesus Christ. Only and only by his blood can our sins be forgiven. You know, any person's blood can never blot out our sins. Any person's life, even if all of us will be crucified on the cross, it can never 
give anybody salvation. It is only and only through Jesus Christ. Whatever good things that you do without Jesus Christ, it's useless. Right? Now, that's why the next word, it says, so that no one can boast. Now, I love to make this example. Uh, generally, if you are sick, if I am sick, okay, we will go and seek a doctor, right? If we are very sick, we'll go and find ourselves, uh, ourselves a good doctor. You know why? Because we know that the doctor can heal us, can cure us, can give us medication, can, can prescribe us medicine so that we can be healed. Now, whatever I do, I can never totally make myself you know, well by just self-medication, by general principle. Okay? By doing self-medication, I can never be well. I need to go to a doctor, right? You need to go to a doctor. So in that sense, the doctor is very much important to all of us. <clears throat> and I am at the mercy of the doctor. We are at the mercy of the doctor. Whatever the doctor prescribes and tells you to do, you will do it because you know that he can make you well. Now, what if I can make myself well? What if I know how to cure my illness? Then I don't need a doctor, right? You don't need a doctor, right? I don't need a doctor. Then. The word of the Lord will be true. Therefore, if I, don't, if I don't need the doctor that can heal me, if I can heal myself, then I can boast. I can tell to all the doctors and say to them, I don't need all of you because I can heal my own self. You are useless to me. And that is what God is telling us. If you can, by yourself, can save yourself by your own good works without Jesus Christ, then you can boast to God. And you can say to God, hey, God, I don't need you. I don't need your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross because I can save myself. Then we can all do that boasting in front of God. And then probably we can laugh at God. But God said, no. Whatever you do, even though how good you are, without my son, without Jesus' blood shedding on the cross, you can never be saved so that you can never boast. It means that we need God, we need Jesus Christ. We are at the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 10, it only confirms that our own good works cannot save us apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. Because part of God's creation in us, part of God creating you is that you do good works. You can see the word Christ Jesus created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You are therefore, we are therefore created by God to do good, and God expects you to be good. So you can never boast to God, God, I am a good person, then I can go to heaven. No. Whatever good things that you do, we will all fall short of the glory of God without Jesus Christ. And you are created by God to do good. And you are expected to do good. When you are employed by a, in a company, the expectation from you is you have to, be, to give your best. And doing your best is just you are doing what you're supposed to do. The same thing. We are created by God to do good works. And, you know, doing good is actually good. Doing good is actually good. I don't say it's bad. It's really, really good. But being good apart from God, don't expect to be saved because you need our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the next reason people would say, well, brother Mike, I go to church. I go to mass every Sunday. I pray regularly. Then I'm good. In Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, again, <clears throat> I have seen, I have heard over the years, many people, they say that they will have, God will, will open the doors of heaven because they are prayerful, because they don't miss church every Sunday. But let me tell you this. 
praying and calling to God is not sufficient. It is not enough for you to go to heaven. Doing it without Jesus Christ, without adhering to what the Lord Jesus Christ tells you to do, tells us to adhere, then we fall short of the glory of God. Again, it says there that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, the third is that often people would say, you prayed the sinner's prayer. In Acts 2.21, they say that this is what the sinner's prayer is. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, for more than half a century, so many people have been taught that praying for forgiveness of sins is the way for salvation, the way towards salvation. You pray your sinner's prayer. You repeat after me. And then after that, you are now saved. And that is what they call uh, the sinner's prayer. So in the minds of millions of people, they only need to pray. I only need to pray. Call upon the name of the Lord and I will be saved. And that's it. You are saved. You go in front of your monitor and you pray. You pray with the ones praying inside that tube and then you are saved. Call upon the name of the Lord. On your deathbed, on your deathbed, you just prayed the sinner's prayer. You just pray, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. Come into my heart. And then you are saved. Or you call someone, a minister, a pastor, or someone who is in the cloth. You pray. Let that person pray for you and you will be saved. That's how they say the sinner's prayer works. Praying to God is good. I'm not saying it's bad. It is good. It is our way of communicating to God. It is actually good. It is great that we pray to God. It is in the Bible. We can read from the pages, the, from the pages of the Bible that we should all pray to God. It is good. But to, to pray something like a sinner's prayer, as we call it, and think for yourself that you will be saved, then we must again think. Praying a certain prayer is not sufficient enough for us to go to heaven. And then the fourth one is that many people think that they are saved because they believe in God. I believe in God, brother Mike. I'm good. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do this. As long as I believe in God, then I am saved. You know, believing in God is great. No doubt about it. Believing in God is great. Nothing is wrong with believing in God. The fact of the matter is we all need to believe in God. We all need to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. For without faith, it is impossible to please God, according to Hebrews chapter 11. But here's where the challenge lies, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends. Many have set this mentality that hey, if they believe in God alone, if they believe in God alone and have faith in Jesus, then that's good enough for heaven. And some would even throw a Bible verse at you to support their claim. Well, sure enough, my dear brethren, we can read it in the Bible that one person believe and you will be saved. You, you read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son and whosoever believed in him will be saved. You see? Only believe. But it is that what's the real meaning? Is that what's the real meaning behind the word believe in the Bible? But faith alone is not enough to get us to heaven. In James chapter 2, verse 19, you say you have faith. Is that good or bad? You say you believe. Is that good or bad? The Bible says it's good. It is good. You believe that there is one God, and that is good. That is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. The Bible is, is not saying it's bad. It's good, actually. Good for you, the Bible said. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in fear. 
And the Bible tells us if, we, if you believe in God, that is wonderful. That is good. Now, here's the thing. If we just only believe, if you just only believe in God, and on the other hand, the devil only believes in God. You believe in God, you just only believe in God, and the devil only believes in God. Then let me ask you this. What is now the difference between you and the devil? To be honest, there's no difference. If we only live to believe in God and not be obedient with God, just like the devil, he believes in God, but he is not obedient to God. That's the difference. If we only believe in God and not be obedient to God, and the devil believes in God and not obedient to God, then what's the difference between me and the devil? There's no difference, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, those who will be watching this. There is no difference. If you say that I believe in God, then look at this verse. The devil even trembles. The mere fact that the devils hear, hear the word God, he trembles. Why? Because he knows what God is capable of. He knows who God is. But sometimes people, they even mock at God. We even use the word of God, the name of God, the name of Jesus in vain. We don't tremble. But the devil trembles. You see? He is afraid. But we are not. We are even mocking at God. Believing in God, that is good. I'm not saying it's bad. That is good. But it is not enough to say that, Brother Mike, I believe in God. I believe who Jesus is. I believe I know his birth. I know the story about his birth, about his death, about his resurrection. I know all this. But knowing all this is not sufficient enough to bring you to heaven. Those are not enough. Now again, being a good person, going to church every Sunday, praying to God, believing in God, those things are good. Those things are great things. But those are not enough to have that salvation for our souls. Now the Bible tells us, you know, that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Even with utmost sincerity, my dear brothers and sisters, even with utmost sincerity in our hearts that we are trying to be good, utmost sincerity in our hearts that we don't want to miss church every Sunday, we don't, have, we, we don't want to miss fellowship every time there's an opportunity, with our utmost sincerity that we, we are living uh, a prayerful life, that we believe in God, you know, doing it our way and not God's way, we are missing the point of salvation. If you are doing it your way and not God's way, then you are doing it all wrong. Those things are what seems right to a man, but they don't lead us to heaven. In Acts chapter 10, 1, 2, and 3, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. About nine hours of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God came in and said to him, Cornelius. Now, here is a classic example of a person who've done it all. Those things that we discussed, he done it all. He was a good man. He was a prayerful man. He was a devout man. He was, God, he was a God-fearing man. This person, he was a charitable man. But the question is, is he saved at this point in time? Now in verse 3, an angel of God came <clears throat> to Cornelius. Why? Because God wants to show Cornelius the way towards salvation, the real way towards salvation. If Cornelius was already saved, then an angel should have not come to his house. But an angel of the Lord came to him and showed him the way towards salvation. 
In 47 and 48, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Cornelius was a good man. He was a devout man. He was a, a family man. He prayed to God, but he was never saved at the time. Only and only when Peter came to his house, baptized him into our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> 9 to 11, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This is pertaining to Apostle Paul when he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. After Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he fasted for three days and he was praying for three days. The Lord <clears throat> told him, verse 11, go to the house of Judas on straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul for he is praying. Paul was fasting for three days. Why was he fasting? He was fasting because he was remorseful of what he did. When Jesus showed to him what he did, he was remorseful. He was repentant. That's why for three days he was fasting. And what else he was doing? He was praying to God. And you know why he was praying to God. He was asking for God's forgiveness, for God's forgiveness. You don't pray for nothing. For three days, fasting, and he was praying. And at this moment, there was something still missing with Apostle Paul. There was something still missing to him. He was fasting. He was repentful. He was remorseful. He was praying. But still, there was something missing that he needs to do. And in Acts 22, verse 16, when he went to Ananias, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. You see, doing all those things, being good, being prayerful, being charitable, being generous, those are not bad things. Those are great things. But those are not enough to get us to heaven. Those are not enough to give you the salvation of your souls. Now, during the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the apostles were telling all the people about Jesus Christ. They were preaching about Jesus Christ. Then in verse 21, uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we just read a while ago, they told the people, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The apostles told that to the people. Now, did the people listening to the apostles understood the meaning? understood when the apostles told them call upon the name of the lord and you will be saved did they understand the meaning well apparently not now why did i say that because in verse 37 of acts chapter 2 the people again ask brothers what shall we do you know brother, what shall we do we don't we don't understand how it is to call upon the name of the lord what do we need to do? Right? Now, look at this very carefully. Peter responded by not, okay, by not saying, you know, we already told you what to do. We already told you what to do. Just call on his name and you will be saved. Peter did not answer it like that. His answer was, an explanation of, of what it meant in, 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 in verse 37 and in verse 38. And this was his answer. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Again, Peter told them, this is what is meant by calling upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You must repent of your sins. You must be baptized, immersed into Christ. Then you will be forgiven. Your sins will be forgiven. This is what we mean when you call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You see, salvation is, it is not just by praying alone. It is more than just praying. 
We need to be obedient to God. So again, the question, how or what must I do to be saved? Now you must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 14. That is the basic. You must hear the gospel. In Acts 37, uh, Acts chapter 10, 36 and 37, again, referring to Cornelius, in 36, Peter said, you know the message. And in verse 37, you know what has happened. So Cornelius knew who got this. Cornelius knew the message of God. So he heard the gospel. The next is that you must have faith. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 8, 24, I told you what you would, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. Now, what was meant when Jesus said a person must believe that I am he? Now, a person must come to believe that Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Savior, that apart from him, there is no salvation. That, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, must, you must believe in about Jesus Christ. That God, that he is God, he is the Lord, he is the Savior, he is the Messiah. He died for your sins. You know, Cornelius and Paul, they certainly believe all about these things about Jesus Christ. Again, you must have that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible tells us to repent of your sins. To repent of your sins. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand his slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Indeed, Paul and Cornelius repented of their sins. The 3,000 men at Pentecost that were baptized, they all repented of their sins. Then you need to confess, to profess Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Cornelius confessed because even before he was baptized, he was a devout man of God. And the people heard about the Gentiles, about his family being saved, being converted into Christianity. Now, Paul, of course, on the other hand, we all know that he was very vocal about his faith in the Lord. You see that when a person accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, it is expected that that person would profess, would confess Jesus Christ, would confess the newfound relationship, his newfound relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible tells us that a person must be baptized into Christ. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Cornelius, Paul, and the Ethiopian eunuch, they were all baptized into Christ. If you will read the book of Acts, you know, what they call the book of conversions, you will find many people. You will find people that, are, that were baptized into our Lord Jesus Christ. Then finally, you need to continue in your faith. Colossians chapter 1, 22 to 23, it says there, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you his, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So when you all do those things, then you must continue in your faith. You know, indeed God did not leave us wondering, wondering how we are to be saved. God laid down the ways 
for you and I to follow so that we can attain salvation. Now, in all of this, in all of this, you know, we see all of these things. You must hear the gospel. You must believe. You must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent of your sins. You must confess of Jesus Christ, and you must baptize into Christ. This all will come into play in God's plan of salvation. Now, a person, no matter how good you are, without repenting, without professing, and without being immersed, being baptized into Christ, you can never be saved. Even how religious we are, even if we shout out loud that we have faith in God, if we are living our lives in accordance with God's mandate, then we fall short of God's glory. Even, you know, even if we do all of these things, even if we were baptized into Christ, but if you will not remain faithful, if you will not continue to be faithful in the Lord until your last breath, the Bible tells you, you fall short of the glory of God. You know, what matters God or what matters to God is our obedient faith until the end. And that is what matters to our Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 6, 46, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? We must be continuously be faithful to God until the last of our breath. Here is what obedient faith looks like. John 14, 15. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. John chapter 5, verse 3. John 14, verse 21. And that is what, again, what obedient faith looks like. You know, God, again, God is not short of instructing us how we are going to be saved. You know, salvation is not up to us. It is not up to us. Salvation is what God mandates. Salvation is what God laid down in the book, in the Bible. It is not our own doing. It is their doing. But we need to do our part. Without Jesus' blood, we can never attain heaven. My dear brothers and sisters, let us all together continue to be faithful. If we let go of Jesus Christ in the course of our life, then we fall short of the glory of God. Let us spread, my dear brothers and sisters, let us spread this gospel of salvation to everyone. And to all of you who have not yet accepted the Lord in the right way, it is my prayer that you will complete the goodness in your heart that you are doing. That you are doing. I know that you are uh, sincere in what you are doing right now. You are sincerely good. But let me encourage you to accept the Lord the right way in accordance to the Bible. It is my prayer that in your utmost sincerity in serving God, you will come to realize that you are falling short of God's glory and that you will open your hearts to this message and complete your sincerity. Now I know that we all want to heaven, that you want to go to heaven. I want you to ask yourself this question again. What must I do to be saved? Brothers, sisters, and friends, this lesson is yours. Study it. And I hope and pray that you will come and accept Jesus Christ the right way. Why not complete the faith by adhering to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, finally, let me leave you with this verse. In James chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. God bless you.